future, talk radio will actually educate, inspire, and make you think. The future is now. Topics and music that affect your life from Universal Broadcasting Network. Tune in at ubnradio.com. Now that you've found UBN Radio and discovered our quality talk shows, it's time to spread the word to friends, family, and the universe. 24 hours of music and talk. Radio without limits. That's why people keep coming back for more. That's UBNRadio.com. Jump off that exhausting hamster wheel and into balanced living with Dr. Marissa. To be a beneficial presence on the planet. Her purpose, to be your personal advocate to live, love, laugh, learn. Her life motto, don't die wondering. Take back your life with Dr. Marissa Fett on UBNRadio.com. And welcome. You are tuned in to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. My show about hope and happiness. That broadcasts every Tuesday and Thursday out of the Sunset Gower Studios and out of KCAA AM 1050, my NBC News radio channel, on Thursdays. But today is Tuesday. That means we are at Universal Broadcasting Network. And it's interesting, on the lot, we actually have Nicole Kidman and Julia Roberts today, and they're filming their new film. So it's a lot of action, a lot of fun, and just really grateful that I have this opportunity to splatter joy all over you if you've missed any of my past podcasts or interviews with some incredible guests, uh, many of them past Oprah guests, uh, Don Miguel Ruiz, Dr. Michael Bernard Beck with Marianne Williamson, and then on the Hollywood side, Leave it to Beaver, uh, Marianne from Gilligan's Island, Don Wells, who will be here in two weeks. Uh, actually, she's going to be here next week. So just if you've missed any of them, please go to my YouTube channel or my iTunes channel or my website, the number four, balance.org. Although this next week, it's going through a little revamp. So if you go there and can't get there, just go to my YouTube channel. And congratulations to last week's winner of the Asian Oprah giveaway because of all my past Oprah guests and also because I was honored uh, many times but uh, last year twice with Asian Entrepreneur and Asian Heritage Award. So Diane Ficklin, Ficklin won the consult with Chris Ward last week's guest who beat colon cancer stage three with a vegan diet. So congratulations to Diane. And I didn't put an applause there, but we can do a little yes for the for the giveaway. And yesterday was Dr. Martin Luther Jr. King Jr.'s birthday, uh, not birthday, but his uh, Remembrance Day. And I just wanted to say a little sound bite that uh, we are just so honored to have had him in our generation or in this uh, life planet series where we can remember him with clarity and the words that he uh, did to uh, he he basically helped take racism out of the house and it is our job now to get it off the sidewalk off the street off of uh, out of our country out of the planet and and that is our job now as we continue and and I encourage just as I did yesterday on Facebook all of us the one thing we can do is to make peace and to be in good relationships with just those people around us uh, same color of skin different color of skin so that we can continue the work that uh, Dr. King did so that's my Martin Luther King Jr. message on Take My Advice, I'm Not Using It, Get Balanced with Dr. Marissa. And this month, we've been focusing on health and good health. That's why I had Chris on last week, and we had callers talking about resolutions the week before. Today is no different. I am grateful that I have a woman who I actually met. She's a friend of a friend when I went out for a mini little retreat up into Big Bear, and uh, my friend Helen is on the board of this great nonprofit organization called Angels in Waiting. Mm -hmm. And I invited the uh, beginning, the founder of Angels in Waiting, to come on the show today and talk about how we can help the health of our babies. And uh, she calls them the America's Forgotten Children. So without further ado, please welcome to my studio, Linda West. <laughs> Hi, Linda. 
Hi, Marissa. So grateful to have you. I, oh, I... honey, I am so deeply honored <laughs> and touched that you wanted to interview me about my program and about America's Forgotten Children. So thank you, thank you, thank you. Yes, and a love piece shout out to Halen who brought us together. Yes, she who, did. Who's on your board. And then, you know, I had to have you on because you let me beat you at catchphrase. <laughs> <laughs> So barely, I didn't have a choice. Let you be busy. Yes. <laughs> Wonderful. We had a fun evening, did we not? Yes, we did. Yes, we did. And this program is a very interesting program to me because not only are you doing something that is helping an area of need in our country, you're actually saving money to our state. So let's just jump in. First, who are America's Forgotten Children? Well, let me tell you, um, one thing I'm very happy that you did request for me to do this interview because I actually went online and did some homework, and actually I was shocked with what I uncovered mm. uh, about the plight of America's foster care kids. Right. And um, let me just give you a little stats, and then we'll go That'd into my expertise, which is medically fragile foster care children. But uh, in California, our foster care system pays less to foster a child than a kennel charges to board and feed a five-pound poodle. Um, Ouch. The foster children, I know, is that not amazing? Yet, and I could honestly tell you, I um, was at a friend's house, and she just had, um, and that, that was one way I did find out these statistics. Mm -hmm. She had a check that she got for her um, drug withdrawal baby, and it was $465. And in fact, I, she was online trying to get her poodle into a kennel, oh. and uh, that charge came to 520 so we were able wow. to see, right. like, oh my gosh, what a great little reference tool to right, use here. Right, right, right. And, um, and so when I started doing further investigation, what I found out that foster children get significant funds at the state and federal level. Mm -hmm. The problem is there are so many bureaucratic fingers that are in the money pool, yeah. and a lot of the people that are pulling funds from that child allotment has no access to the foster child or even their interest and as a result as it comes down the pike it gets very misappropriated to state mm -hmm. salaries and sadly by the time it comes down to the child and the foster parent there is minimum amount of funds to meet that child right, needs. Right. you have to consider if it's only 462 when you look at the cost of formula and diapers and clothing and right. daycare, it's barely enough. It's, they're upside down, yeah, exactly. And yeah. so we kind of wonder, well, gosh, no wonder why we can't get enough foster parents. Right, and right. So, yeah. yeah, and another data that I uncovered is just in California alone, we have over 56,495 children that are in foster care. The vast majority reside in L.A. County. Hmm. Um and so, but one statistic that I was shocked when I ran across, in L.A. County, less than 4% of the youths are adopted, and our national average is 32%. So there's definitely yes. something that we need to yes. investigate and see what, what is the holdup that's yeah. occurring in I this actually, area. I am actually familiar with that statistic because I've had Christine Devine on a, a couple of times. I don't know if you're familiar with her. She's yes, a Fox, I'm very familiar with Fo her. Fox anchor who, you know, has won 16 Emmys because of her, you know, helping with adopting difficult to d adopt children or difficult to place children. So I know that statistic. So that this whole system needs revamping. And just and I'm that's why I'm I wanted to bring this as a focus of attention just like I brought Clyde Terry and looking at the prison systems that's not working. If we're going to leave this planet a better place than when we started, we've got to do something about each of these systems. So the first thing I wanted to do is thank you for doing what you do. It is a nonprofit, so it's not something that you're you know, you went to school for, <laughs> oh, <no>. right? <laughs> you went to, you oh, actually, no, Deb, I'm a neonatal nurse okay. by trade. Right. So, I was uh, going to yes, ask I about that. I one so, pound little preemies wow. and I'm much more comfortable on doing that than being on a radio show and talking. So wow. I just want to, to say that I'm a nurse by trade. I'm yes. not a spokesperson or anything as such. But, but you, you do know, very you well. You on the uh, prison system. <laughs> right. And one thing that I did find out that at any given year, the foster children comprise of less than 0.3% of our state's population. Mm -hmm. And this was, was amazing to me when I researched this material. But 40% of the persons living in homeless shelters 
are former foster care youth, and a similar disproportionate percentage of foster children are entering into our prison systems. In fact, the number comprised from anywhere from 36% of uh, the inmates were prior foster children to 76%. Wow. So, you know, in essence, that's who our California or America's Forgotten Children are, are being foster. railroaded into the homeless shelters wow. and into our, you know, in essence, our own I'm California so, prisons. I, I am so glad I made you do this research. <laughs> <laughs> I am, too. I was, like, uh, like, like appalled in, in essence, yes, you know. Yes, yeah, and it's funny and, because... And, you know, especially when you look at... You know, here we have a high speedway system that's being placed in, and the minimum cost of that is eighty-six billion dollars. Right, and for yet our we drivers. have our own children in our own backyards being railroaded into mm. homeless shelters and our California prison system. So, you know, it would that, just be nice if we got a small little portion of these funds, right? To you know, to help fix our failing foster care system. Right. And it's not only in California, it's rampant throughout the rest of our right. nation. But especially our, our numbers in our... are no different than the numbers in New York that are no yeah. different than yeah. anywhere else. So. But especially in L.A., which is where where we live, where I live, too. And, and if you've just tuned in and you're wondering what we're talking about, you have tuned in to take my advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. And I have on the line with me, Linda West, the founder of Angels in Waiting. And it, we've been talking about foster children. And I'm just blown away by that statistic that even though foster children only make up point, what, 3% of the population, that 40% of the homeless in LA are from the foster system, have one at one time been a foster child. And why this is blowing my mind is because about A month and a half ago, I actually sang on Skid Row. My first time, thanks to my choir boss, Ricky Byers Beckwith, she took us, you know, some of us, uh, 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 some of the choir, the Agape International Spiritual Center Choir, and we went down to Skid Row, and it's just, it's, it's, if you haven't done it, you need to go there and, and just experience uh, to balance out your good life and see what is happening. And I remember leaving there going, you know, what there's got to be a solution whatever we're doing is not working because it's getting more than less and now that you're telling me what you're telling me it it really it's we it, there's a there's something that has to be done at all angles so systemic angles for, in the foster uh, care system so that's gonna that's gonna haunt me. <laughs> I know that there's I know that seed's been planted now, and something's gonna come out of that. So thank you for that. Or, oh, you're or, very welcome. Yeah. Thank you for letting me do my homework. <laughs> I, I was equally as uh, you know in, uh, shocked shocked yeah. when I started seeing the yeah. numbers and did a little bit more re- research. And what's amazing, this is all online, so you know right, our right. senators and assembly people are also aware of this, mm-hmm. and you know yeah. It's, yeah. yeah. So, so this is what I like to do with my guests is, okay, so you, you by training our neonatal, I want you to take me back, take a breath. I'm going to connect with you and you're going to take me back into your past. And when did this idea to form Angels in Waiting come? So you're doing your job, you're, you're taking care of uh, preemies under or a pound, right? And then tell me what happened. Yeah, actually, I um, basically... Angels in the Waiting was born about a decade ago. Okay. And what I, we started to see as far as the neonatal intensive care units across Southern California and actually across our nation is an influx of micropremies. And a micropremie is a, is a premature infant that is born less than 26 weeks. And okay. uh, a full-term baby is 40 weeks. So this is a very tiny little preemie, and as a result, we call them micro preemies. Okay. And we were seeing an influx of micro preemies because of methamphetamine use among pregnant women. Uh. And there was also what also hit our nurseries. There were online recipes on how to abort children early, utilizing a very simple cocktail that we all have in our uh, medicine cabinet and then used in two lines of methamphetamines, and for obvious reasons, I don't want to give out the cocktail. Right. And uh, so we started seeing an influx of these children that were being born extremely premature Mm. with methamphetamine exposure. And uh, sometimes what happens, if we do see premature labors, 
or a condition called abruptio, where the placenta and the womb separates from each other, we automatically drug test because we know methamphetamines, cocaine, and a whole plethora of other types of drugs can cause this. Mm. But once the baby or the mother tests as positive for the drug, that child automatically becomes word of the court, a.k.a. Okay. a foster child. Okay. And so what I started seeing, and sadly the new faces into the foster care system were premature babies. Mm. And, you know, especially now after reviewing the statistics, we, you know, we know the plight. Right. And so what so, I personally so, started... So there's definitely, there's definitely an increase in meth use, which is leading to meth babies, and then more... Which is leading to premature okay. labor, which so is t- leading to meth premature babies. Okay. And, uh, and literally, I've been a nurse for, I'm going to date myself here, for almost 35 <laughs> years. You use and oil of I've seen I've every seen you drug. Look young. Pardon? You look young. You use oil of okay. <laughs> <laughs> You started when you were five. I have a passion <laughs> for, behind me. Yes. Um, but literally, I've seen every drug come through the nursery. I've seen the PCP, the crack mm. cocaine, the heroin, and of all the drugs, I could honestly say meth is by far the ugliest because mm. for some reason it takes over that maternal bond. All the other prior drugs that came through the nurseries in the past several decades, the maternal bond had a stronger hold than the drug, and that we don't see that with methamphetamine, sadly. Okay, to explain and so that. that's another explain. reason why we're having an influx. Yeah, Linda, explain that to me. So, I'm sorry? So explain that to me. So, so other drug-using pregnant moms... When they have the child, what do you mean when you say the mother bond is stronger than the drug bond? The maternal bond, the, um, it's the bond to care and love and nurture that child, uh, the stronger... Um, so even if you're, you're than, a drug than the user... Drug that they were, that the, the illicit drug that they were taking at that time okay. frame, like way back in the 80s, it was PCP, you had your crack cocaine, you okay. did have your heroin that came through, but it seemed like... That, that they were able to get off the drug to jump through the hoops that the Department of Family and Children's Services wanted them to jump through to get their kids back. Uh, we're seeing a different beast altogether with methamphetamines. Mm. And I think if any listener out there that has a child or a loved one that has taken it know completely what I'm, t- I'm talking about. It overtakes their personality. Mm-hmm. It's, it's, they're not even the same child or parent or whatever. So as a result, what we're seeing is these infants languishing into the foster care system because the moms Doesn't cannot want to, test can't. negative to get the kids back. Right, right. Okay. So that's like a double horrible. Mm-hmm. And, and sadly, now we're seeing, because of an influx in black tar heroin, we're also seeing meth with the black tar heroin. So we're really now having... <sighs> Very, very medically fragile micro preemies or young preemies uh, with a whole plethora of issues and now going through horrific uh, heroin withdrawals because of the black tar heroin. Mm. I'm so tempted to say something that, you know, I'm called the kinder, gentler Dr. Laura. <laughs> <laughs> but it, this is this is one point where I would actually say what she's been known to say, which is if you're going to do drugs, you know, or if you're going to uh, marry a man that is not good for you, just don't have kids. So if you're going to do the drug, please don't have children. I mean, yeah. I, we don't want you to do the drugs either, but it is it is really, it's just breaking my heart hearing the reality that, you know, I wasn't aware of, which is why I want you on the show so that all of my listeners are aware that this is happening. And, and, I, and I don't say it for us to shake our heads, but so that there's something we can do about it. So continue. Yeah, I mean, this is a crisis that is plaguing every NICU, every Department of Children's Mm. Services across California and our nation. Mm. Um, You know, it's literally in our own backyard, and it's the influx is just amplifying because of methamphetamine use. I mean, Mm -hmm. the drug is very potent, and the problem is a lot of young girls get on it to lose weight in junior high school, and plus you have a lot of dealers, in fact, there's a uh, product called, um, it's called Strawberry Quick, and they're starting to get the junior high kids or even grade school kids hooked on it. Mm. And sadly, with methamphetamines and the very strong strain, you could have two to three lines and you're addicted. And wow. they're addicted for a very long period of time. This and is I like a weight loss. Saying, if you're doing drugs, don't have children, but 
these women and men make very, very poor decisions, right. very poor decisions about their body. And as a result, these infants come along. A lot of them decide they continue the um, drug usage, and as a result, these babies are born premature. Mm. So, uh, so it's of that what the drug easy. Effect has on the body. So, so this actually starts on body image. So, so junior high yeah. school mm-hmm. kids who want to be thin. Boy, I'm seeing all kinds of connections here. That leads to the use, and then you two lines, and you're hooked, and then you go down the line, and we have this situation. That's yeah. scary. That is yeah. very scary. So, so it even starts before the drug use. It starts with body image. Exactly. It starts with body image, self worth. Um, mm. You know, just a lot of, and, and of course. When it, you know, you have a 13, 14 year old girl, that's when their body image, their self worth is right. the lowest just because of the hormonal influx, right. what's going on with the bullying in the schools, mm. you know, what they're witnessing on I'm TV, so... who they need to look like, act like, that whole bit. So, I'm so yeah. glad <laughs> right now that I've had shows on body image and bullying, and I will continue to do so. Now, now this is another incentive because I just thought it was, you know, just straight bullying. But uh, knowing that there's a connection to this is uh, is disturbing. But thank you again. <laughs> Let me thank oh, you. You're this very whole welcome. Show. <laughs> so okay, so you see it influx, it's growing and growing, and then what happened? You saw well, a baby. I, yeah, and I, I saw babies become wards of the court, foster children, mm-hmm. and. Because our healthcare system now got into a business entity, these children were being discharged that still had a lot of medical or quote unquote nursing needs acquired. They may have still had IVs. They mm. may need to have been what's known as gavage feeding, where you pass the tube through your nose and and then feed them that way because they're not strong enough to nipple all of their feedings. Or there could have been a whole plethora of issues. So mm. as a result. As a nurse, I started seeing these little tiny innocent premature infants mm. going into group homes, and it's the same thing as a group home. They sweeten it up, call it a small family home, but it still has six medically fragile children in it and people coming in and caring for it, uh, or institutional care where they're going to skilled nursing facilities that could have anywhere from 25 to 35 beds on up. Mm. and we're caring for these little preemies. Mm -hmm. But when you have, especially now with the superbugs that are out there, when you have small little, what we call them as open petri dishes, in a group home with other sick children, or worse yet, an institutional Mm -hmm. care setting with 35 to 100 different sick children in there, they have a tendency to what we call frequent flyers. They come back frequently into the hospital Mm. because of the superbugs, or lots of times what we would be experiencing is um, failure to thrive issues where they just gave up the will to live. Mm. And uh, so I've seen that over and over again. One thing as being an NICU nurse, I'm a very good IV start, and so the kids would go up to pediatrics, and usually by this time, especially if they need a lot of nursing care, a lot of their veins and access to IVs have been used up, and so they call on us NICU experts. We could get a line on a one-pound baby, a Mm. 10-pounder is much easier. So that's when I started witnessing, because, you know, I cared for that baby while Mm. it was in the neonatal intensive care unit, and now seeing it several months later in a pediatric unit, and they were just wasting away. Mm. And and what it is, a baby's brain is not meant to have 25 sets of hands on it in a week. Its brain is geared to bond with a mother Mm -hmm. or a consistent caregiver. And you do not get that in institutional care. Right, right. You know. Absolutely. You can't. I mean, it's not, no matter how good the caretaker is, they've got 25 or the the home has, I mean, I know they're doing the best that they can, but it's not the way, it's... it's not yes, because it's not when good. you feed it, it becomes a job. You, you're not right. moving at it and pinching his cheeks and looking in his eyes, right. and, you know, because right. you have seven more to feed. Right. <laughs> or, right. you know, changing the diaper. You don't get any of that positive interaction. interaction. And as mm-hmm. a result, the babies pick up on that and they more or less, you know, failure to thrive basically means that mm. when you compare that same gestational age, that same uh, chronological age mm-hmm. and the same diagnosis, 
And if that child is not weighing the same or meeting the milestones and developmental skills, if it's falling below the graph, then that is indicating that the child is is failing to thrive. It's given up the will to live. Yeah, and that's and actually that. that's Stop actually that. a term, right? Failure it's a to term. thrive. It's actually or... a medical diagnosis. Uh-huh. Okay, reactive. And there's a lot of issues that could cause it, right. but we see it frequently in institutionalized children mm. or children that are in group homes. In, and that's related to your reactive attachment disorder. Well, reactive attachment disorder is um, kind of failure to thrive on steroids. Uh-huh. <laughs> um, it's Reactive attachment disorder, if a baby does not attach, and there's a lot of studies, they say normally before three years of age, Mm -hmm. but now more studies are shown that they have to bond with a significant other before 18 months of age. Mm. And the problem is when we're looking at our foster care system, I mean, an infant in the foster care system before its first birthday, the average, it will be in three foster homes. Wow. That amplifies drastically if they're medically fragile. Right, I mean, sadly, lots of times we would have a child, and this is what I was witnessing, we would have a child that would be in the hospital, and then we're like now, okay, it's time to be discharged back to the group home or the institution. Well, that bed spot has already been taken. Uh. And so now we're trying to find a different location to house that poor, innocent child. Right, right. And so, you know, I started seeing this issue. I started seeing, well, you know, now it's going to another, you know, group mm-hmm. home or another mm-hmm. institution, or worse yet, we would give it to a, a less educated, poorly supported foster parent that mm-hmm. had no clue on any of the nursing needs that that child needed. Right. And every time it sneezed, it was back in an emergency room. Right. Or, or well, what happened, they got too scared, and they said, you know, I'm too scared to care for this kid. Right. And boom, it goes into another foster right. home or, you know, back into a group home or institutional so, care. So. so the child that needs one bonding not only doesn't get the one bonding while it's in the group home, when it does get placed, it gets multiply placed. So exactly. that's exasperating that. So there's and, and that's when reactive attachment disorder okay. comes into okay. play. And that's because that child by then may be eighteen months, two years and, and it's like gives up. Why why am I going right, to right. you yeah. know, reach out right when you know, so they give up the will to live and a lot of reactive attachment, they don't give you eye contact when you come to approach them, they don't want to be lifted up, they uh-huh. don't want to have any human a- uh-huh. reaction whatsoever. And, um, and this is know, and, and this a is very a, very sad diagnosis. Right, this is, this is a three like a three month old. Irreversible. This is like a three month old, right? We're talking about like tiny children who, at three months or you know very very young, don't want to look at you in the eye. Exactly. That, in fact, I I actually care for a foster child that they're literally selling her in a parking lot for methamphetamines at two and a half pounds, no prenatal care. And she was literally one of the worst failure to thrives I've ever seen. I mean, mm. she would just no eye contact, lay there like a rag doll. We definitely, you know, did MRIs, CAT scans. Everything was normal. She just de- gave up the will to live. Uh, and, and surprisingly, it was uh, uh, my dog that was very in tune to this and would not leave her side, would, would lay with her, uh, would nestle with her. And, I mean, the only time he would leave is to go eat or go out to use the bathroom, but would be right back with her. So it's Uh, funny how innately animals know know. what these children need, but yet our our system doesn't know what they need. Our system doesn't need. And, you know, I was a psychology student. You know, my degree is in organizational psychology, but I did an undergrad in uh, clinical psychology. And, you know, everybody, actually, you don't even have to be a psychology student to know about the rhesus monkeys and how what, what happened when you didn't have contact as a baby monkey. I mean, you just drastically are, are, are not normal and you don't have attachment. You have an attachment disorder. So here, this isn't a monkey we're talking, we're talking about babies who mm-hmm. learn how not to attach based on the environment that we're in. And that is 
if not disturbing, I don't, I'm just like horrified. So what we're going to do is we're going to come back after break and look on the bright side and, and talk about this wonderful thing that you're doing now to turn this system around. So stay tuned with me. You're listening to Take My Advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa. Focus on Health January. We're looking at how we can change the fate of these beautiful little babies on Take My Advice. We'll be back in two and two. Do you want to be a part of a holistic solution to our broken jail system? The Emerging Leaders Academy is helping reduce the California statistic where three out of four people return to prison within their first year out. In partnership with the LA County Sheriff's Department, LA Urban League, Goodwill, Long Beach PD, and the Agape International Spiritual Center, ELA, a nonprofit program, is a transformational path to opportunities with responsibility and a recognition of the unique role we all have in this thing called life. If you would like to be a partner in someone's inside out transformation with career development, entrepreneurship, therapeutic literacy, financial education, and hope to those who think they have no alternative than to return to jail, then be the change you want to see and become an ELA partner. Visit emergingleaders360.org today. What's the most powerful word on the planet? Yes. If you want to be inspired by award-winning authors and teachers who write about the many facets of yes and how it transforms life and one's love of life, then pick up the Yes Book today. Jill Cooper and Exalt Road Publication brings you stories of transformation, confession, research, poems, and manifestos that witness the power of yes. Available at Amazon and ExaltRoad.com. The Yes Book, a perfect affirmative gift for the holidays. Say yes, I want to celebrate my life. And we're back. My name is Dr. Marissa. They do call me the Asian Oprah. And we are here with a fabulous guest, Linda West, who's talking about how we can help our premature folks. And before that, I just wanted to give a plug to one of our sponsors, Yes Book, Jill Cooper. And I'm actually in that book in uh, the chapter called Yes to Me, Myself, and I. And I say this because we are always looking for like-minded, love-hearted sponsors to sponsor shows like Linda's today for all the things that we do here on the air about hope and happiness. So please do take advantage of um, my uh, January, actually our New Year's special on um, on our very, very affordable rates. And you can contact my assistant producer, Jarvis Essex. You just find me anywhere and say, want to talk to Jarvis and we'll get you all hooked up. So back to Linda. So you've, you're seeing all this um, amazing, and I'm, you know, I was just talking to Jarvis during break, is you know, why I wanted you on is he had no idea. Like most of us have no idea. We don't think about the connections. We don't think about what's going on in our own backyard. So, so, and as we continue with uh, what you're doing, I wanted, knowing where you're going to go, I wanted to also present you with the Dr. Marissa Beneficial Presence on the Planet Award right now for the work that you're doing for this population. So what is it? I just gave the end, but because <laughs> I because I know it's good. What are you doing? So you decided that not only are you starting to foster these little ones, so you have two. What came next? Did we lose you? Oh, oh no. Did we lose? I, I think. Oh, so I'll just um, <laughs> go to my balance bar. Do we lose her? Can we talk to... Tony, can you call her on the other line for me? We somehow lost her in the break. Hello, can you hear oh, me? Oh, phew. I thought I lost you. Oh, no, I think I'm here. Okay, did you hear <laughs> your... Thank you for that award, oh, by good. the way. I, did the pre- I heard everything. <laughs> I don't know if I was muted or yeah. you muted me. <laughs> okay, so so you, so you carry on with uh, where you were. Well, basically, what happened, I can still recall an incident very clearly uh, about eight years ago. One of my friends, a neonatal intensive care nurse, Caroline, bonded with a foster preemie. And knowing what her little future was slated for, Mm. I heard her whisper, Miha. Oh, it's going to still choke me up every Mm. time I say this. But if I could take you home, I would. And it just rung a chord with me. And I'm like, why the hell can't she take her home? If anybody is highly skilled to care for this child and love it, 
it's a nurse. It's a nurse that's a pediatric or neonatal nurse that does this for a living. Mm. So as a result, and I was in the midst of being a medically fragile foster parent myself. And, you know, I was shocked um, on the stipend that I got to pay to care for. Actually, it was $40 a day to hang over 15 medications, IV, give chemo, and literally clock in home as a nurse mm. uh, uh, with a medically fragile foster child. So I was thinking, God, no wonder why they cannot find nurses. Right, right. The vast majority of us are either our breadwinners or, you know, we make good money and mm-hmm. we cannot afford we're living off of $40 a day. And right. so as a result, what I ended up doing is uh, I created a nonprofit 501 charity called Angels in Waiting, and I did this charity to recruit nurses to bring awareness of the plight of America's foster children, especially our micropremies and our medically fragile. Mm-hmm. So I went ahead and um, recruited. We have over 70 nurses now doing this. Fantastic. Throughout California, we mm-hmm. have an 85% adoption rate. That's one reason why wow. I'm constantly looking for uh, more nurses. My, <laughs> I'm currently adopted two and possibly looking at adopting the third child Aww. that's currently in my home. Home. And what once are they call you mommy is all over. Yeah, <laughs> I bet. I bet. What are yeah. their names? Uh, Autumn and Sammy. And um, hopefully, if everything goes right within the court system, Anthony. Oh, shout yeah. out to all three of you. Thank you for sharing your mommy today. Yeah, <laughs> thank you. And which and one so, was, what's um, the name of your dog? My dog is Toby, and he is an amazing therapy dog. He's, it, it's amazing how innately they know what these kids right. need and so love them. Right, so shout and out to Toby, too. I love you. you. Thank you for all the work. And I'm, I'm guessing that it was Autumn that he was laying beside. Yes. Okay. Yes. That is, we are that's very so right beautiful. on that one. So, that's beautiful. Um, so, but, you okay. know, just because I really don't want her story out that, you know, sure, uh, just sure. because of how graphic everything is yeah. with her. But, yeah, sure. Yes. You're right about her. And she um, was literally, now you would never even know she even had a failure to thrive. She's a spunky little six-year-old. That That's great. <laughs> it's going on 89, so Aww. very old soul here. That's wonderful. Yeah. Okay, and, so then you started the, and you looked at it, and, and there's a legislation now that you're involved in. Exactly. Actually, I um, the problem is once I had all my nurses set up, I have no problems recruiting nurses for this. Mm-hmm. Um, and w- when I realized I was only making $40 a day and there was no way I was able to recruit very highly skilled nurses from the hospitals, the pediatric units, and the neonatal units at this, I got online and Googled uh, in-home nursing care Mm -hmm. and found a dormant program that was created by President Johnson way back in 1965. Mm -hmm. That um, way before my time. Yeah, I think I was five by then. That um, that enabled nurses to take these medically fragile children home, especially if they were slated to go to institutions or into group homes, Mm -hmm. and turn around and build Medi-Cal for their nursing hours. So I Mm. went, hello, this is the answer. Uh, It took me six months to resurrect the program. It was a federal program that was dormant in the state of California. In fact, it's dormant in the rest of our nation, too. Mm. Mm. But it took me six months to resurrect it, where I was able to turn around and build Medi-Cal for my nursing hours, right. and now was able to nicely supplement my income rel- relatively close to what I would make if I would clock into the hospital. So then I said, aha, yeah. now I have the tool where I could recruit nurses. Right. And right. Um, the roadblock that I ran into was the social workers, due to their high, I mean, they have an extremely high caseload okay. with medically fragile but what they were ending up doing is continuing to place their children into group homes and institutional cares while I had highly skilled neonatal pediatric intensive care units with just nurseries that were all blinged out you know here we have nurses with their open hearts and their open arms wanting these kids and the social workers were not placing them with us and every time I would inquire on this is and one reason why because a lot of the nurses were case managers within in very large hospitals so we knew where these kids were being 
placed. Mm -hmm. And um, when I would ask the social workers, why are we not placing these children with nurses? We already have the outcomes, the poor outcomes of institutional care Mm -hmm. and group homes. The answer was time and time again, and I'm telling you, Marissa, it was probably 20 social workers Mm. that, you know, Linda, I would love to drive out to 15 different nurses' homes. I just don't have the time to. Uh, My caseload is so, so high that I don't have that luxury. uh, And so, in essence, what it did mm. is made their jobs a lot easier, and it wasn't in the best interest of the child. Right, right. But you can't really totally um, blame them To go ahead and write a law. Okay, and or initially wrote a bill, and I got online and I researched and found out what was the best senator, or at that time she was an assemblywoman, um, to, that actually walked the walk within foster care, and that was Holly Mitchell. In fact, mm. she's in the L.A. district. And, Yay, Holly! Um, Yay, she Holly. carried the torch <laughs> with me. And when we started writing the bill, I actually had Karen Bass that called in and said this bill will not save California millions. It will save California billions of dollars. Wow. Because one thing that very high-skilled nurses do will make sure that that child is not a frequent flyer right. back into the hospital. Right, you right, give that right, child right. a skilled nurse, plus we're not going to have the super bugs because we're only caring for up to two babies from our home. Mm-hmm. And mm-hmm. because we're skilled nurses, we know like, oh, maybe that child needs to be on antibiotics. Let me call the doctor. and Maybe I need to give an extra IV right. of fluids or... Right you know, an, an additional all the treatments. Yep. So we mitigate potential re-hospital readmissions. Mm-hmm. And, w- of course, with our adoption rates being so high, because, you know, these kids, you know, I always say miracles occur through the hearts and hands of nurses, and I've seen this <laughs> time and time over uh-huh. again. So as a result, we went up to um, the, you know, our capital, Sacramento, and the AB bill was called Assembly Bill 1133, Mm -hmm. and um, we presented it, and during our government shutdown last year, we got 100% yes votes from bipartisan parties. Wow. And uh, yes, we were like landslide votes. So with all... Similarly, (laughs) we knew it saved the state of California millions, and so I'm sure all senators were on board with that. Still. And... um, I'm sorry. Still, this is this is you know with all the stuff you know I was at the gym this morning and because of the State of the Union address, everybody's talking about you know their views and how government isn't working. It's nice to have a story of when government is working well. <laughs> well it's working well. In fact, yes. In, uh, and I will segue into that statement after the end when we won through this. You know, you, we went through the Senate and won and got a hundred percent votes from that end. Um, and I flew up there with several children so the senators could actually see the program in action. And uh, it was funny. I'm like literally under the dome in awe. And um, uh-huh. about 10 senators came up to me after the, after the vote and congratulated me on the bill and said um, to me, they were, they came up to me and they're like, you know, we were just kibitzing back and forth. Like a little lady, you know, your program was started by President Johnson way back in 1965. And what we were just puzzled with, and we were just talking back and forth, we literally pay people at the state and government level six figures to come under our dome to save us money. And here you are, a nurse from the private sector, Mm. coming under our dome, and literally one guy said, and showing us our asses. And he said, you know, um, can we ask you, how did you uncover this program? And so I kind of sheepishly looked at him and said, I Googled it. And one senator, he lost all of his composure. He's like, shut up. No <laughs> way. You Googled this? I go, yeah, it took me about 30 minutes on, you know, you know I said, it took me about six months to resurrect it. Right. But it was out there on the internet. Right. So it was just kind of funny that, you, go. you know, they kind of acknowledged it was a nurse from the private sector yeah. that kind of That's helped nice. them out. That's right. And uh, and even one of the senators says we kind of agree with Karen Bass. We do think that it just makes sense that right. you will save the state, not millions, but possibly billions. That's of fantastic. That's and fantastic. So how do we? Um, so first of all, I asked. I did a couple of things on the promo when I knew you were coming on. I said, if you're a nurse, you need to listen to this show. <laughs> well, thank so, you. so, so if you're a nurse, how how do nurses get involved in this? Because obviously, that's the skilled expertise that 
that is required for this particular population. So let's start with the nurses. How do they get involved with you? Well, basically, uh, you go to my website, angelsinwaitingusa.org, and you could learn a whole lot from the Nurses Needed page. Mm -hmm. But in essence, if you have acute care experience working in the hospital, I do not decide who gets the job or who doesn't. Medi-Cal does, so you fill out an application and you become an independent nurse provider for Mm Medi-Cal. And then what you do is become a foster parent for medically fragile children, and there's two venues. You could either go through the state, the Department of Family and Children's Services, the Department of Children and Family Services, their name interchanges from Mm -hmm. county to county, or you could go to a private agency that's known as foster family agencies, make sure they're licensed for medically fragile, and do your foster parent that way. Mm -hmm. But if you call me, I'd be happy to hold the nurse's hands and um, have them navigate through both of the Department of Children's Services and Medi-Cal EPSDT program. And I'm bringing this uh, specifically because of the work that I get do get to do. I have many people who come to me and say, I hate my job. I just hate it. Well, what, what, what do you want to do? I don't know, but I just hate my job. And so if there are nurses out there, and I know there are, who say they hate their job, but sh- and, they, and, and people think that because they hate their job, they want to do something completely different. And I'm saying that you're good at what you do for a reason. So if you are a nurse and you have those skills, here's an area that you will, you know, talking and knowing you as I do, Linda, you love what you do and you are in joy as you're doing it. So this is a free avenue for anyone who has nursing skills to get involved in something that really is making a difference on the planet. Exactly. If you're burnt out and you're burnt out of working your 12 hour shift every other weekend, I'm, I'm like, Doing a call out to nurses, honey, clock in at home. Yeah. You, you could really <laughs> there you go. You'll the life work at of home. a child. Right. I'm, I'm warning everybody, 85% adoption rate. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> and but, that's not um, a bad thing. And that's not yeah, a bad thing. Yeah, but it, believe me, it's, it would be the most gallant mm-hmm. nursing career you have ever done. Mm-hmm. And it's Beautiful. nice because you're doing it out of the comforts and the luxury of your own home. And you really impact these children's lives. I already went over the statistics. So yes, absolutely. As a nurse, you could like seriously impact the well-being and the livelihood. And you know, like I always say, together we have the ability to save countless childhoods. Yes. And um, well, you know, so I just want to do that through the hearts and hands of nurses. And right. I think I think we, as a profession, we're large enough that we could really fix or at least address Mm -hmm. and help this foster care industry um, that is actually failing on so many levels. Right, right. I mean, the statistics are out there, and we just need to kind of all, you know, work shoulder to shoulder and help rescue our children that are literally residing in their own backyard. Yep, and uh, just by getting involved in this program, qualifying, which is, I'm sure will be easy, and then bringing a child into your home, one who uh, will not then become, what is that, uh, will not be, uh, will avoid failure to thrive, they will not develop reactive attachment disorder, and then not be placed in three homes in a year, and not have 25 hands on them, attach and bond so that they do not become one of the 40 percent that are found in the homeless population in LA I mean that's or Mm -hmm. the prison system Mm -hmm. I mean that is such a beautifully get it right from the start systemic because what troubles me is a statistic that you said that I that I glossed over but that this is irreversible failure to thrive or the reactive attachment disorder is irreversible you said why do you think we have the 40% in our prisons and right. in the shelters and all that? Right. It's because these kids were not loved at a very early age mm-hmm. when they first, and you know, either, you know, my whole thing is what the parents don't do to them, the foster care system messes them up even worse. Oh. And it's because of the constant changing of the home. Right. The, even if the they were in a good home. Right. Even if they got to one good home, if it's too late, it's too late. Exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So, so definitely... You know, I think we just need to be spot on yeah. and identifying these issues very early on I, and prevent an infant 
from being in three different homes yeah. before its first birthday. Yeah. I mean, literally, I cared for, um, I got the baby at seven months. I was her fifth foster home. Mm. And on her second birthday, they took me, they took the little child, uh, just because a social worker did not want to drive up the mountains. Oh. And so things like that, we need to put, you know, that's one reason why I wrote the bill. Right, right, uh, right. To right, make right. sure nurses got preferential consideration mm-hmm. over the institutional care and the in, and the uh, group homes. That's great. So, you know, sometimes we need to have, make sure our state law has some teeth yeah. to do what's best interest with our, um, you know, our, like I said, America's forgotten children. Right. Wonderful. And then for the general population, uh, one I, I did want a message. I know so many people who want to have children and so many people who are just, uh, you know, I uh, cannot have children, have tried all the expensive routes. I would love that every single person who really wants to have a child to consider the adoption and foster home uh, oh, foster please, process. Yeah. I mean, I really, if if nothing else, I'm hoping that that's a, a takeaway from this show as well because it's desperately needed. Maybe the baby that really, really, really needs to be with you is the one that already is here for you. So Yes, well, it's like the two children I have. They're medically fragile and no longer medically fragile. Exactly. They're like healthy, beautiful children right. and um you know that that will win anybody's heart so yeah i would like for people to you know look at adopting especially yes. if la county has 56,000 children and only four percent are being adopted there's a lot of children that need to go into good yes. loving homes yes, yes. And, and i you it, know it's interesting it just struck me that there's more ads about adopting animals and there's more awareness about adopting animals than there is about children. I just had um, that awareness today. Yeah, Marissa, I mean, I've That's literally like, had, um, I mean, my whole staff, we're all volunteers. Nobody's mm-hmm. on a salary here. I have a very active board, such as Halen, right. and um, and we don't pull salaries. And, mm-hmm. you know, I was scratching my head, why am I not getting donations? So I hired, uh, actually, Gloria Allred, um, gave me a big PR person, and sadly, he said, sadly, Linda, is you're helping foster children that are drug exposed, and if those babies' faces were pictures of dogs and cats, you would have more money than you right. would know what to do with. Right, right. And that's that is so sad. sad. That, but that's it is so sad. Yeah, and it was funny. I When I saw Gloria's picture on your site, I was like, hey, she's been on my show. <laughs> <laughs> and I know she says hi, and uh, please give her my regards, too. And in order to help you, um, I know to to raise money, I brought this guy, and you can't see me holding him up, but this really adorable penguin, and it says, it's got wings, so angels in waiting, and it says on its heart, A-I-W, which is angels in waiting, and I know this is a giveaway for a level of donation to help with your work, and like, you're not pulling a salary, but the, the all of the the necessary smoothing and paving in legislation, in your bills, in all of the work that you do, they do need help. So I'm asking all Dr. Marissa listeners to go to the site, angelsinwaiting.org. Oh no, angelsinwaitingusa, sorry, .org and get this adorable, adorable, adorable penguin. And um, my Asian Oprah giveaway today is to, um, I'm going to give one of these away. So if you have a child that um, loves penguins, this is a perfect, and I know that you will actually donate too on top of getting my penguin. <laughs> but uh, please go to my website, the number 4balance.org, and just put angels in waiting in the subject line under the contact and I will find a way to get this penguin to you. So that is about all the time we have. And Linda, I want to thank you so much for really expanding the awareness in the mind and the hearts of all of my listeners. I wish you the only the best in this new year, full of abundance and prosperity so that you can carry on your work. And of course the love in, um, just thriving these kids. And again, thank you for getting your award, Dr. Marissa's beneficial presence on the planet. 
Well, thank you, Dr. Maris, or, uh, Marissa. I so appreciate you having me on and me able to uh, enlighten your listening audience on uh, the plight of America's forgotten children. So I do appreciate the time and effort you've given me. Absolutely. Absolutely. One more big round of applause. Thank you, Linda. Thank you, sweetheart. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Wow. That was... I mean, eye-opening. Jarvis is like, what? Just completely, we had no clue. I had no clue to the depths of the the issues that we had with our foster care. And now that I know, we know what to do. So this is one of many, many different organizations, but it's one that I know is working because it is not just a cause. It's a cause with teeth. And those are the ones that I absolutely want to support and get out there so that, uh, you know, we can make a difference on this planet and, and to leave it a better place than when we found it. And it's time for our... Uh, balance. Welcome to my balance bar at the end of the show. And I am going to start with our balance tip for the day on the 21 day fast from complaining with Dr. Mercer. We are on day 20 already. It was day one, like the last time I looked and I cannot believe I've been doing this for 43 months in a row and bringing you balance tips every day to keep from complaining. And you have an opportunity now to help me put this uh, fast on an app. So if you would, today's tip, by the way, is from Don Miguel Ruiz, one of my favorite teachers. You won't complain about your insignificant other if you used a more intelligent picker. So he says in his book, uh, Mastery of Love, if you want a dog, don't buy a cat. So (laughs) if you bought a cat and you wanted a dog, you cannot complain that your cat doesn't act like a dog. So you know what I'm talking about. So if you don't want someone who's a, uh, who, who, if you want someone who travels, I wouldn't pick a couch potato. So (laughs) that's the balance tip for today. And again, if you went to GoFundMe backslash H. R-A-X-L-O-H, Rax Low, you'll find me and can donate any amount. And there's all kinds of giveaways that come with uh, with the amounts of donation. And thank you to Elizabeth Schober and R.J. Peterson, the last people who had donated. Thank you so much for supporting the 21 Day Fast from Complaining with Dr. Marissa. Uh, mark your calendars. We are actually going on location, first time, whoop, whoop, on Universal Broadcasting Network. We're going to be at the Conscious Life Expo at the LAX Hilton, February 6th to 8th. And I have three shows that are going to be Friday, Saturday, and Sunday. The first one is called How to Live in the Present When the Past Keeps Kicking My Butt. And then Saturday's topic, uh, Conscious Living for Perfectionists, do this, do that, do this, and end up in doo-doo. And then on Sunday, how to medicate with meditation. Warning, side effects include joy and peace. So please do tune in to UBN all weekend, February 6th, 7th, and 8th, as we broadcast live on location for the first time at the LAX Hilton. And... The month of February is coming up. You will be romanced like a stone. Yoga and love, Dr. Pat Allen. So if you would like to be a sponsor in any of those shows, please do contact Jarvis and we'll get you a 30 second spot for, I think the special is $150, which is a $200 saving on a regular, very affordable $350. But for $150, you get a professionally made ad and you'll, you'll, be helping sponsor our Romancing the Stone shows in February. Uh, Next week, it will be another fabulous episode of Sexual Healing with Dr. Marissa, Ask Marvin Gaye. And you're not going to believe this. It's true. She's coming back. She was such a hit the first time. My fabulous co-host, it's going to be called The Retired Professor and Marianne. Yes, Marianne from Gilligan's Island, and I was a professor for 10 years. Don Wells will be coming back next Tuesday and talking about love, romance, and sex. So if you would like a date with Marianne from Gilligan's Island, actually, I am um, taking, uh, I'm doing a little lottery kind of thing. So if you send me your resume and a picture... (laughs) 
<laughs> I'll go through them and we'll find some to put in front of Marianne uh, next week's show and see what she says. So don't forget next Tuesday and Thursday, you please tune in to take my advice. I'm not using it. Get balanced with Dr. Marissa Pay. That's P for positive EI. And remember, it's all about balance. Peace in and peace out. Keeps making me want you So soft and yet so disturbing The emotion it brings My heart starts to sing A new melody Where's this a few at times I do wonder If you feel half as much as I do but when you look into my eyes, I see no disguise when you touch me. I need your touch, it makes me want to.